much, Marty. I really appreciate that introduction. You're too kind. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I, I'm so excited to be here. It, it really was quite a surprise a couple of days ago when I got the invitation, the invitation to do this. So I want to express my deepest thanks to the IGS nominating committee for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I'm greatly honored and humbled to be here tonight. It's such a distinguished lecture series to be part of. And this is something that is, a, again, it's a major highlight of my uh, adult career. So the title of my talk tonight is called Lessons Learned from Lee Thayer. And Lee Thayer was one of my early mentors uh, who introduced me to general semantics in the late 1980s. Uh, he was a professor of mine at Wisconsin Parkside. In 1970, he had uh, compiled a book called Communication General Semantics Perspectives, where he, I think it was from the 1968 uh, International, um, the, the, con the, the International Congress on, on General Semantics, and he put all that together. And he has always been a, a sort of long-standing friend of general semantics, although he himself has always been a bit of a maverick, hasn't really been able to find, I think, a, a, a home for his liking. He's, he's always had a great amount of disdain for academics. Uh, I think he found them to be way too comfortable with their irrelevance. And uh, he, he also disliked the business community, partly for not being open enough to new ideas and for being too beholden to the bottom line stockholders rather than to the all stakeholders sort of broadly construed. So again, he was sort of homeless there in, in some way, uh, but he's a very prolific scholar. He, you know, there's a new Lee Thayer Institute. He did about 20 books over just the last maybe 15 years or so, and he did pass away just within the last six months. So it was a great loss to, to the community, and I'm dedicating this talk tonight uh, to him. So what I'm going to try to present are seven somewhat interrelated ideas that I learned in my many uh, classes with Lee Thayer. If you want to learn more about some of these, or at least you know, a few of them that are in there, you can find some of that in my book, Communication Uncovered. Again, the General Semantics and Media Ecology book. Um, okay, so let me go on. And again, I'm, I'm going to do these. I, I think people know this. It's very rare when I do a PowerPoint, and I'm really not into PowerPoint, but I thought it would be helpful to kind of identify these slides one at a time. And so, again, I'm going to give them one at a time. There are going to be some interconnections. I'll see what I can do by way of that, but we'll just start with the first one. So the first point, the, the lesson that I've learned from Thayer is that answers to questions you can't raise will be knowledge you can't use. Again, answers to questions you can't raise will be knowledge that you can't use. And, you know, Thayer used to say all the time, you know, answers, the, they're secondary. Questions, they are your answer. You know, questions are your answer. I think it would be so important for anyone who hasn't seen it. You want to go see the, the television show called Whose Line Is It Anyway? And the, ex, the, the activity they do called Just Questions. People should learn to do that exercise, to only respond to one another in questions and to develop that questioning capacity. I think in, in some regards, that was probably the most important thing that I learned in college was how to raise a question. And you know, I, I thought it would be fun to sort of share a kind of crazy story of one of my first times of interacting with Thayer, uh, one of my first classes with him. He comes into class on the very first day and he's got his briefcase and he, he opens up the briefcase, looks at us, and he says, are there any questions? And we're all, no, we all just sat there. He shut the briefcase and went, okay, I'll see you next time. And <laughs> I think we were all just stunned. I don't think you can get away with that kind of stuff today. But anyway, again, this was back in the 80s. And uh, he comes back next class and uh, He's got his briefcase. He opens up the briefcase again, and he says, are there any questions? And a bunch of us raise our hands. We're like, yes, you know, why did you just leave? What is going on here with this, right? And he says, oh, I'm not going to just stand here and lecture at you. If you don't have questions, you're really not up to anything. I don't think you're really serious about your learning. And that was a heavy message to a lot of us. I think it re reoriented a lot of us in thinking about what we're supposed to be doing as a college student. And you know, going back to this issue of, you know, how answers to questions you can't raise would be knowledge you can't use. I want to share a couple more questions that came up in Thayer's class and, and sort of help you think about, we can think together about how engaging questions in certain ways brings out certain responses that deepen those responses 
from just being, I guess, comments or statements into being recognized as answers. And so one day in class, somebody says to him, you know, Professor, what do I need to do to get an A in here? And he says, oh, that's, that's not too difficult of a question. What you do is you just be top notch. You be head and shoulders above everyone else in the class. I mean, you just be superior and, you know, you let everyone see what the ideal is. And if an A goes, it gets handed out, you can be pretty sure that the A is going to go to you. And, I, you know, again, I don't know if you could say that kind of stuff uh, to students today, but I think it got a rise out of a good number of us. And the student sort of wasn't settled with that. And the student said, yeah, well, what if your idea of the ideal and my idea of the deal differ? Then what? And he went, oh, that's such a good point. I think that's correct. I think that can happen. We could have different ideals. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take whatever it is that you hand in, no matter what you hand in, I'm going to take to be your effort to show us what you think is the ideal. And I think the student knew that they'd been beat. Again, their, their line of questioning led them into the realization that when he said, I want you to do the ideal, he wasn't kidding. He was actually being serious. And that turned from just him giving a statement to him actually giving an answer when the student was actually questioning it. Now, have you ever thought about questions? I wonder how many people have actually thought about questions, like what a question is. It's so odd. Like we can ask questions. We can even ask a question like, what is a question? Maybe not know the answer to it and yet still be able to be questioning. You know, how is that possible? What is a question such that I can ask what is a question without knowing perhaps what a question is. Could it be that all real thought is a question? Everything else is memory. Real thought, genuine thought, has the form of a question. It in, it's an interrogation in openness, looking for some kind of response. I think at the least, now maybe, maybe not all thought, genuine thought is a question. I think that, that, that maybe makes sense. It might, does it? Does it make sense to you? Uh, I think we can at least haggle with, or for less, and suggest that there are no answers without questions. And again, if we ask, are there answers without questions? Well, no, there just seem to be statements. There's a statement, and there's another statement, and there's another statement. But if somebody raises a question, then suddenly that, that statement becomes an answer in light of the question. You know, Alan Wheelis is a wonderful line where he says something is meaningful when you can raise a question to which that something is the answer. Now, again, something is meaningful when you can raise a question to which that something is the answer. Now, if that was in any way meaningful to you, I, I'm not sure if it was, but my guess is if it was meaningful to you, it's because you were able to raise a question along the lines of when is something meaningful or how do things become meaningful? Right. Now, I'm somewhat here trying to prime people for questions at the end of the talk, because I would like to have some interaction. And we'll see, I'm probably going to try to go somewhere around 35, 45 minutes here or so. I'm already I'm going quicker than I thought I would, uh, or I, my, I, my time is just really flying here. Uh, but I, I, I want to try to see to what extent over the next, uh, you know, half hour, or 35 minutes, uh, I can try to flood you as best I can with answers. And if they don't seem like answers, if they just seem like statements, maybe ask yourself, what are the questions that could be raised that would help turn these statements into uh, more apparent answers? Okay, so then again, that's the first uh, real insight, the first real lesson that I learned from Thayer. Again, the answers to questions you can't raise will be knowledge that you can't use. Now, the second one that I want to mention here is this is a, a much bigger, like massive concept, and we can talk about this. Uh, I'm going to see how much I can get this in in a, in a reasonable time period. But it's that the knower and the known are inseparable. The knower and the known are inseparable. Yeah, that what you know and the thing you know that with, they're two aspects of the same thing. There's, you've never not been in your world, and you're the constant, and because you're the constant, you don't notice how your, you know, your, your nervous system, your beliefs, your worldviews, your ideologies, there's so many ways in which what we bring to the world makes the world part of what it is, and we can't get access to the world just, quotes, as it is, you know? 
I think some of the real robust ways of coming at this, you know, that, that happened a while back was when um, Adelbert Ames developed the Dartmouth, uh, the optics lab. And if you've ever seen the Ames room or the Ames window, you know what I'm talking about, right? It has perspective built into it. And so like the Ames room, the people look as if they're very tall or very short when they just move from one side of the room to the other. Or the window, you know, the window rotates and it has a stick that sort of like slides in and out and through the window, changing its perspective. Uh, and again, I think, it, it, I think one of the better ways to, to get uh, into Ames's stuff is to go get this wonderful book that Hadley Cantrell had done uh, called The Morning Notes of Adelbert Ames Jr. It's really got some just amazing sort of notes on all the different ways that the perceptions that we have of the world are the world plus us. But again, we don't ever get access to the world as it is. It's always the world plus us and the plus us is making so much of the difference. Right? I mean, this is Gregory Bateson's statement when he says, we don't perceive the world, we perceive the products of our perceptions, right? Now, there are contemporary examples. I think, you know, rather than just going to, to uh, Ames's work, I think, you know, in the more popular world, especially with the internet, there were the example of the blue and white dress, or there was the Yanni and Laurel, or more recently, if people haven't seen it, the uh, brain uh, storm in green needles. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can put links when this video gets recorded. I'm going to try to post links onto the uh, YouTube site so that people can check out some of the things that I'm talking about here. But I think, you know, the, the general point that I'm trying to suggest is that we always have something like an interpretation that guides, shapes, and really makes possible our experiences. It's not just that we interpret our experiences. I mean, we say that expression. We say, well, make sure, you know, are, are, you, are you interpreting your experience in the right way? And, you know, can you change your interpretation? And those are good strategies, and we can talk about all that. But there's another sense in which it's more complicated than that. It's that it's not just that we interpret our experiences. It's that we experience our interpretations. That is what we call experience to begin with is already an interpretation. It's an abstraction. It's a delimiting. It's a filtering through. It's a contextualizing. I mean, this is so much of what Korzybski was saying when he says, whatever I say a thing is, it is not. Or when he says the map is not the territory. When you look at him, when he devises his structural differential, right? You have the, the event level of all the sub micro sub microscopic processes that are going on and then you have the objects that the senses are able to arrest out from that to delimit from that and then you have the various verbal levels and i think in all of that again what we keep what we keep seeing over and over in this theme of the known and the known being two aspects of the same thing is that it's you know, it's like what Heisenberg says, right? He says, what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. It is the method of questioning that we have and that we bring to it is partly what makes it uh, appear to be what it is, right? And Postman and Weingartner in their teaching as a subversive activity, right? They say, what anything is depends upon how, who looks at what. Right? But there's very, we don't have to get all like, you know, pulling our chin and all philosophical about it. It's very practical in some ways. I mean, think of the very simple example of listening to a foreign tongue. Now, when you listen to a foreign tongue, you just hear one word, or I'm sorry, you, you can't really hear one word after the other. You just hear like a rapid succession of sounds, and they disappear as rapidly as they appear. But when you know the language, you can hear the words out of those stream of sounds. You can hear when one word begins and another word ends. And to that extent, you, it seems like the meaning is in the words themselves, but it's not. It's in the interaction or the transaction of you bringing your knowledge of the language to those speech sounds. Or take an example of reading a book. You sit down and maybe it's a difficult book and you start to read it and you say, wow, this is really difficult. It doesn't make any sense. And then you read it more, you talk with some friends, you go to class, you hear some lectures on it, and then you go back and now you reread the book and now it makes more sense. Well, what's changed? It hasn't, or if it has, it has because you have. That is, as we change ourselves, the world that we experience changes. Right now, I guess one of the ways to shake this out again, in terms of practical applications, 
if I say that the interpretation always precedes the experience, so that when people are experienced, is the world plus them. Well, it means that when people talk about things, they inevitably are talking about themselves. Right? This is why you get Jacob Bohm, who says whatever the self describes, describes the self. Is how you get Spinoza, right? Spinoza says whatever Peter tells me about Paul tells me more about Peter than Paul. Yeah, people implicate themselves when they talk about things. I mean, not only is this the case with the word shibboleth, that is, if you pronounced it sibboleth, it wasn't going to end well for you. But think about something like a dog. You look down and you see a dog. Now, if someone even uses the word dog, it doesn't say much about the thing they're looking at. You know that they speak English. And then if you ask, is the dog food? When a person says a dog is food or isn't food, what we're really learning is more about their culture's orientation and their experience as, again, as filtered through beliefs, backgrounds with that particular organism. The same could be said about someone talking about Jesus. When someone says Jesus is the Son of God, are they talking about that person? Well, I guess they, we could try to say that, but what we're really saying is they're a Christian. If some person says, well, no, actually Jesus was a prophet, we're saying, well, this person is not a Christian. They're perhaps of a different faith. Perhaps they're, they're Muslim. Uh, if somebody says, well, there, there was no historical Jesus, we're likely guessing that there may be an atheist, atheist, or at the least, they're not a Christian. Okay, so that's my second, uh, second lesson from Thayer. Again, it was that the nor and the known are two aspects of the same thing, right? Now, my next uh, lesson here, next lesson, is that the most important decision you ever make is who to have as parents. <laughs> yeah, There's a line from Choran, that one that Thayer used to like to use in class. And I, I, it's one that always stuck with me, and I really do love Choran's work. But yeah, the most important decision you ever make is who to have as parents. And it, it's very true that in one sense, nothing was more faithful to your life than who happened to be your parents. I mean, literally, if you wanted to be a Kennedy or a Rockefeller, you were going to have to be born in there, uh, sort of adopted in, taken in by them. And it was a total power play. Uh, you know, you, you, your earliest days were, were a colonization in some way, right? That if you would have been born into uh, a different part of the world right now today, uh, you know, a radically different country, or if you'd have been born, say, three or 400 years ago, your mind would be very different. And that's sort of what I think this, uh, this particular lesson is talking about, is the degree to which our mind is social. I think we've over-psychologized mind, right? But again, we, we, we don't realize how much it was fateful, right? Like, we're not in the crib thinking to ourselves, oh, mom and dad, please teach me German. I want to be a mathematician. No, you're just stuck speaking the language of the people that uh, are speaking around you. And, and that's like, like a fact, right? That there's no way out of it. It's not that there's no way to just organically speak language without it being a particular language. And we all learn the particular language of that particular tribe, that culture uh, that we've fallen into. And I don't think we have to just stick with the, you know, this fact, this sort of like obvious fact that there was a fateful decision that was made and as our parents gave birth to us and there we were within that milieu, but that we're continuously being influenced by others and we're picking quotes our parents. And I don't mean like defooing where you're, you know, getting rid of your parents and you're actually trying to be adopted by someone else or you're trying to establish yourself as someone else's child. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't know if people actually do that. I think, I think people were actually doing defooling. I think some people still do. Uh, but I think the, the notion is that we're always being influenced. And the question is, who are you listening to and how are they influencing you? Um, and I think some people are more or less strategic about how they're picking their influences, how they're picking their friends. Can't say enough good things about a book that was done, uh, I think it was in the late 70s, by Harriet Zuckerman called Scientific Elite. And she does work on the sociology of Nobel Prizes. It's a fascinating book. I mean, so I'm sure it's changed since she did this research because the diagrams are so painful. But she basically did a study in everyone who won the Nobel Prize in physics, chemistry, and biology. And what she found is that everyone who had won the Nobel Prize had studied with someone who had one. And so you can see the importance, again, of, of who you're letting influence you and how you're allowing, again, your world to be colonized in some way by those others around you. In some way, this is what we mean by time binding. And I think the, the point here would be that although we sometimes talk about time binding as if it aligns with progress, certainly not always, uh, I think we want to be cautious of that. I think the, 
you know, one of the implications of time binding is that humans are not the most intelligent of creatures. We're the most plastic. We're the most subject to our own tampering. You know, over many, many centuries, we've been able to create historical conditions that now shape the way that our minds uh, operate, the way that our minds uh, function. And again, I, I think it can't be stressed enough, mind is not inside the skull. It's a social historical process. And it can't be separated out from things like the alphabet, literacy, the mirror, the photograph, all of these things, which none of us personally invented, have shaped the way that we experience ourselves. I think one of the critical questions in how we pick our parents is how other are the others who have otherized us? Do you have really other others who are otherizing you or is it just more iterations of the same? I think some of the concerns that people have about information silos on the internet and that people are just self-selecting information that already reflects and confirms their worldview. It, it's quite, it's a legitimate concern. I think there is a, there's a real need to be otherized. I think that's why study is so important, why history, why the engagement with books is so crucial. And it's also why travel is so important because you, you meet others and they so otherize you that you can come back to yourself and see yourself with new eyes. Right? Um, when I do my systems theory class, I sometimes like to talk about Ashby's law of requisite variety. You know, Ashby's law was, was really designed in, for physical systems on information handling capacities within you know, physical systems. And it was basically suggesting that the capacity had to be equal to the complexity of the information load that was there. And we can say something similar to each of us, that each of us as a communication system, we can only meet the complexity in the world by internally complexifying ourselves. That is, you're going to have to try to be as complex internally as that, in, that outward complexity uh, that you're trying to register. And, you know, long short of it is, I think we all need really great friends. We need really well-built libraries. That's so much of what designing one's mind and carefully growing, growing, growing one's mind uh, is all about. Okay, uh, I'm going to go on to my, my fourth uh, lesson here. And so my fourth lesson is, again, you can, hopefully you can start to see how some of these are interrelated. My fourth lesson here is, if you can't be a different person with different people, then all those people will be the same person. Yeah, if you can't be a different person with different people, then all those people will be the same person. Yeah, a different way to say that is what makes people who they are is who you are when you're with them. Well, that's what makes people who they are. It's who you are when you're with them. Now, I think we're all fairly aware that we share different information with different people. We, we make parts of ourselves available that we keep secrets uh, to, to others. And... I think in the, in the wake of Goffman's work, especially, you know, we're, we're so aware that we have different faces and we strategically manage information. And there's, there's audience segregation and partitioning practices and, and lots of different ways to manage impressions and identity. But I also think it's so much deeper than that, the more that we think about it, really sort of register how much we are who we are only in relationship to others. And that's partly what makes them who they are is who we are when we're with them. Uh, try to think about the, all the different ways that this, again, sort of fleshes out, right? I mean, it's, again, it's not just that kids hide their spring break escapades from their parents, but their parents hide their sex lives from their kids, right? Uh, but this, here's an example of it, maybe sort of force it a little bit more, right? So it's a bunch of old people, and I mean old, old people, they're sitting around going, you know, leg pain, taxes, you know, blah, 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 another thing, my arthritis acting up. And again, they're, they're not having much fun at all. Then some person brings in a, like an infant, a very young baby, and this baby's like, uh, hardly even knows that it's there. Suddenly, all the old people start perking up and they're going, ooh, who's a fun baby? Blah, they're doing this and all this kind of stuff. And they're engaging and they're laughing with the baby and they're tickling and all this kind of stuff. And then somebody removes the baby and then they go, oh, aren't babies fun? And it's like, well, no, not really. So you were fun when the baby was there. You were being fun when the baby was there, right? Uh, to, again, to try to realize those those differences that we have with different people and how those relationships make those kinds of interaction like what they are, right? Like, again, people aren't substitutable, right? They're not substitutable. 
Uh, if you see some friend who has, or maybe a bit better, a person you don't know, and their significant other walks up and gives them a pat on the butt and then a kiss, you don't go, oh, I see you like butt patting and kissing and go up and have a whack at it. No, I mean, the exact same behaviors, actions, when performed by the rightly related, they're an affirmation of relation, they celebrate relation. Those actions performed by the wrongly related are a violation, right? They're utterly inappropriate. Uh, the long short of it here is you want to make someone in your life absolutely special. I mean, non-replaceable. What you do is you share certain parts of them with you and you have them share certain parts. With, again, you share certain parts of yourself with them and have them share certain parts with you that you don't share with anyone else. And that's structurally about as close as you're going to get to recognizing, again, the, the non-interchangeability of folks and how we are who we are in the particular relationships uh, that we're in. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to pick up a little pace here. So my next uh, lesson from Thayer here is, the more information that you access that you cannot or will not act upon, the more powerless you will be in your world. Again, the more information that you access that you cannot or will not act upon, the more powerless you will be in your world. Oh, I think we all see it, that people are drowning in information overload, young people especially. Do you ever watch them in like a public place? You sort of look over someone's shoulder and you can see what they're doing as they're digging around on their phone or on the, on the internet. It's really strange. I mean, go, go watch them for a while. They flit around. They do a, you know, a scroll for a while up Facebook. Then they go to Instagram. Then they go to Snapchat. And then they go to Twitter. Then they go back to Facebook. Then they go back to Snapchat. And the whole thing, it's like hours pass. And it's this frittering and fooling, wasting of time without any real relevance. Or if it does have relevance, it's trivial or it's insignificant. It's not robust purpose. Um, you want a, a very good example of what I'm talking about. Again, the sort of powerlessness and or the kind of impotence that people have in their lives because of information overload. Think of how many people, like young people in particular, they're watching the world news while they should be doing their homework and they don't vote. You know, I mean, well, of course you're going to feel powerless. I mean, look at what's happening there. And I think the more you, you try to get at this issue of irrelevance and triviality, I think we can start to see Facebook for what it is. You know, it was in the, what, 1970s, 1980s, when tabloid culture just hit like no tomorrow. And everyone was an image and in a magazine and a paparazzi would jump out and tell you what the latest star was having at the latest restaurant. And we knew all the gossip about who was fighting with who and all this kind of stuff. And young people growing up in that world came to see themselves as irrelevant, insignificant. You know, like even if I say to you, you know, Jennifer Anderson or Tom Cruise or Kim Kardashian, if you know of them and they've never heard of us, we're irrelevant. There's no way into that game of us knowing about them, but them not knowing about us, about us without us being sort of like structurally in that system being irrelevant. And so I think what young people did is they went, I see real people are an image. If I can become an image, I'll be real too. And so Facebook was sort of like star celebrity culture brought down to the individual level where now each person can be their own paparazzi. They can jump out, take a selfie, show that wicked burrito they had for lunch, and then talk about various relationship opinions and other things. And they're, again, they're trying to remake themselves in terms of celebrity culture, I guess in an attempt to make themselves relevant. And there's, there are other things. I mean, I think it is true that Facebook is a kind of immortality technology. It gives a promise in the same way that writing a book does or making a statue or a painting, but it gives a promise of sort of living on after your death. And it's interesting, the number of Facebook uh, pages that become memorials after someone passes away. Uh, but here, again, we get, we get, get the takeaway here. Like, what's the point of this, this lesson? Well, there's a recipe for potency. You want to be potent in your life? I mean, really potent in your life? It's very easy. Only access information that you can or will act upon. Get rid of all the stuff that you're really not acting upon. Right? You got to ask the question of ROI. 
right? Return on investment. I'm not the business sense of investment. That is the price you pay when you pay attention is that you can't pay attention to anything else at the same time. What is the return on that investment? It's a very simple exercise. If some student, you have some students or young people and they say, well, I really have some goals. I have some things I want to do with my life and I'm trying to figure out how to make that happen. Here's what you do. You take out your, a list and you make goals, maybe five short term and five long term and you write those on the piece of paper. Then you pull out a calendar and for a month, you're going to do hourly daily logs for the month on exactly what you did with that hour of each day. And then you're going to see how those hours and those days line directly up to those goals. I think if you actually do the exercise, you will find that most people aren't really up to that much. They're not actively seeking their goals, at least not in a vigilant way. Instead, they're consuming a bunch of information that amounts to a confession of, of irrelevance and triviality. Okay, uh, next one here. I, I'm getting down to my last last couple here, folks. Uh, next one here is the, uh, the line here that most people prefer problems they just can't solve to solutions that they just don't like. Can most people prefer problems they just can't solve to solutions that they just don't like? I think we can see this on so many fronts, right? I mean, it's personal and social problems. They persist I guess because people say, oh, you know, the, the cure sounds worse than the disease. We've heard it here several times in response to the pandemic. You know, it's been already mentioned that the lack of taking seriously people's responsibility to act with regard to concern of others' health, more vulnerable populations, has led a lot of people to claim, well, this is a problem that's just beyond all of us. And it partly is, but it's partly exacerbated, and it will be a problem that can't be solved because people don't like the solution. They don't want to have to be sheltered in place. They don't want to have to wear a mask, and they go, you know what, I'd rather have the problem than the solution. I think this happens with, look at poor diet, and, and you know, people aren't getting enough exercise. Daniel Lieberman's book, oh, it's a must-read, The Story of the Human Body, basically talks about the importance of exercise and how much your body it runs differently. Your memory is better. Your sleep is better. Your digestion is better. I mean, we're meant to be more nomadic, more hunter-gatherer. I mean, with millions of years behind us that's asking our bodies to get more exercise. And we're seeing all of the health consequences. You know, co morbidity rates are Even though mortality rates are going down, morbidity rates are rising. Many people are going to die from a uh, a disease associated with life-limiting diet and, and lack of exercise. And instead of trying to do those things, they just say, well, it's a problem I can't fix, and or let's get a doctor here to give me a pill to sort of protect me from myself. I think we can say the same thing about climate change. You know, I think climate change is, you know, you say, oh, well, we want to do something with the climate, but I don't want to have to give up my air conditioning. I don't want to have to give up all my conveniences. Um, I think students, they oftentimes say they want better grades. Oh, I want to get good grades but then they're not sure how to shut down their social media platforms and their other things to get themselves to do it. Uh, you know, Thayer, again, tells a, tells a somewhat witty story. I and mean, this was, you know, he was teaching in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and he sort of wrapped up in the, I think, 91. Uh, but there was a time he used to tell a story in the 70s where this young woman comes into his office and she has a low-cut low blouse on and, and uh, says, uh, you know, professor, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not doing that well in your class. And he goes, oh, no, I haven't really noticed that. And, and he says, what's the problem? And she says, well, I just, I want you to know that I would do anything to get a good grade in this class. And he goes, really? You'd do anything? And she goes, yes, I would do anything to do good in this class. And he goes, anything? And she goes, anything. And he goes, read the book. And again, I think there is this sense in which, that's, that was like the one thing that people, I guess, in this case, uh, she wasn't really uh, interested in doing. Um, I think we want to have, many people, they want to have better health care, more affordable health care available for more people. But I think people say, well, I don't want to have to pay the taxes. And because of that, uh, it persists. Um, okay, I guess I'm going to go on to my, my last one here, and we'll, we'll see where this takes us. So... My last, my last uh, lesson from Thayer is this one here. Communication, no matter how referential, always remains fundamentally consequential. Okay. Communication, no matter how referential, always remains fundamentally 
consequential. You know, I think when people begin thinking about language, there's a tendency to think about language as if it's a bunch of labels for things in the world, and we act like that's the problem of communication. You know, we don't understand each other. You use this word, I use that word. We can't understand each other. But I think we're missing what, what communication is all about. You know, again, for Thayer, communication is one of two basic life processes, and it's a continued condition of trying to tell what's going on in our own becoming who we're be, we are becoming. It's not as if we're just animals in space navigating around. No, we're time binders. And in our time binding, we engage in co-navigating to and co-creating futures. Not only futures like in the sense of acts and events, like we were able to schedule this AKML uh, in, in, the, in the past and now pull this off right here, but we're able to, to again, navigate toward um, things that we haven't even like thought about before, you know, things that are in the distant future. We can plan for our retirement. We can uh, make plans for, again, future dates. And we can ask questions of who we're, we're becoming as we're understanding the world as we are. And it's not as if the problems of communication just refer to, or they, they boil down to different people having different labels for the same thing. I mean, yeah, there's bypassing. People do sometimes have different words for the same thing or, you know, the same word for different things. But oftentimes it has to do with the consequences, right? What's going on there? I think when the consequences are unconsciously being foisted upon people, we talk about it as ideology. And when they're consciously being driven toward, we talk about it as rhetoric or symbolic action, right? Think of a, a husband and wife, they're at the dinner table and the husband says, can you pass me the salt? And then the wife passes the pepper and he says, oh, I said, pass me the salt, please. And she said, you know, you have a heart problem. Right? And so, again, sometimes the communication has nothing to do with the referential dimension. It has to do with us in our becoming who we're, we're becoming as we're interacting with one another. Yeah, with words, we make things happen. We make things happen. That's why things like politeness, all forms of politeness, they're already registering something like the dynamic of managing a sense of self. It's not as if we're just labeling things, right? And a simple thing like please or thank you, right? They're for, for good or ill, right? We are. We're binding time in the way that we make sense of things. And I think it, the more that you think about the way that words are used, the more that you can really get into it. Again, you want to get away from the like dictionary as holding the language. I think it's, it, literacy is the culprit in a lot of this, right? I think it's, it, it, when we think about language as if it's all just held in the dictionary, it does seem like each word just has a meaning and it's all about the reference of the different words. But I think the more that we look at the way words are actually used in interaction, this consequential dynamic becomes very clear. Like, try to think of like the classic hierarchy of abstraction stuff. So you have the really high, if I take these three words, so I have the word woman, it's pretty high in abstraction. Then lady, lady's a little bit below that, right? Lady's a little bit below that. And then if I go a little bit further down, I can go Sue. Now there is this woman, she's a lady, and it's my mom, and her name is Sue. And we might try to think about those as just different labels at different levels of abstraction, but as soon as we go to the way those words are used in interaction, it becomes so apparent that communication is consequential, right? That is, if I come home and look at my mom and go, hey, woman, or hey, lady, or even if, I'm, you know, in my youth, I tried to bust out with a hey, Sue, she's like, well, what's getting into you? What's going on? This is, change, this is signifying some sort of change in our relationship. And so it becomes, again, very apparent that words aren't just incidental to the scene. They're partly how we make the scene. I mean, we declare war. We make proclamations. People are pronounced married or divorced. So I thought maybe I'd wrap up on this one with, you know, I, I saw Jackie had held up the crazy talk, stupid talk, and maybe to give a little voice to Neil Postman's uh, apocryphal story of the three umpires. So... Evidently, there's three umpires, and the first umpire hasn't studied much about communication, isn't aware really of epistemology and the problems of epistemology, and he says, I call them as they are. Call them as they are. Now, the second umpire, he's a little bit more versed 
he's, he's familiar with some communication theory. He's aware of the problems of epistemology, the problems of, you know, the, the inability to get at the knower and the known independently. And he says, I call them as I see them. Call them as I see them. Third empire, this is a scholar's scholar. This is somebody who studied at Cambridge with Wittgenstein himself. He says, until I call them, they ain't. Until I call them, they ain't. Again, there are some things that have to be said by those people or they won't be said, and they can't really be real until they are acknowledged. I mean, I think when we talk about apologies, when we talk about uh, forms of interaction where it's the the end result was the issue. It wasn't getting the right label. I think that's partly why, you know, somebody can be making an overture for a date and they could cough it out in the worst way. But if the other person's interested in the overture, it goes over like gangbusters, right? So I guess what I'll do is wrap up on that with one of Thayer's, I guess, more cited lines, one that he would like to say to students in class and it appears in a good number of books, which is, as we communicate, so shall we be.